Hello friends, and welcome to The Hanged Man in the Moon. If this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm pleased to meet you. If you've been here before, thank you for returning. I'm truly honored. Friends, if you are a returning visitor, you know that my deep dive into the Thoth system is coming to a close. In fact, next week, I am going to be running off into the woods because I teach a summer camp. If you've been following me along with me, you know that I do a summer and winter camp. And while I'm there, I still do uh, readings for the channel and for you. But while I'm there, as my last hurrah with the deep dive into the Thoth system, the system created by Lady Frida Harris and Aleister Crowley, I'm going to do a, a few side-by-side spreads. And what I mean side by side, what I mean by side by side spreads is that I'm going to be reading spreads with both the original Harris Crowley Thoth deck and with the Tarot of the Holy Light, which is a continental, a recreation of a continental tarot by Christine Payne Towler. And I'm going, so that's what I'm going to do for the last three weeks or so of this deep dive into the thought system, I'm going to be doing a, not really a comparison spread, but a side-by-side, -side, a, a dive into these two decks to see whether or not they are compatible, whether or not we can read them together. I'm betting that we can, that I can, and hopefully we can, um, because all things are possible, right? So friends, you can mark that on your calendar. Um, the week after this video goes up is when that video will, the first video of those probably three or four will be going up. Okay? So friends, today, what are we up for? What are we into? Well, <clears throat> this is my Back to Basics series within my Deep Dive into the Thought System series, right? And so I've got a spread already laid out. The spread I will show you in just a couple of minutes. But before I look, we look at the spread, I'd like us to, again, draw our attention on a specific topic. And the topic for this week, or the place I think we want to be focusing on this week is what? When living the intentional life, there are some qualities and characteristics that are beneficial. Yeah? Um, being able to be persistent, consistent, committed, and resolved are wonderful things. They can be very beneficial when living an intentional life. As long as we recognize that as we are consistent and we are persistent, we are also evolving and the things that we have placed on our powerful current of intention can shift or change. Within that, those parameters, having consistency is very beneficial. We begin a project and we work on that project. We enjoy working on that project to its completion or to its logical, I don't want to say end because nothing ends, but in the direction of its creation, right? However, sometimes that consistency, that persistence can also attract a little bit of attachment to it. And when we become attached to outcomes or processes, we move from being committed or consistent or persistent or resolved into stubbornness. And stubbornness is not a beneficial characteristic for living the intentional life. Being stubborn. As a Leo, I can tell you, stubbornness is not a good thing for an intentional life. What is the difference? Being persistent and consistent is the opposite of being flighty and inconsistent. Yeah, it's being able to keep doing the tasks that you have started planning on doing. For example, you begin a project and you are consistent with the development of that project. 
you are resolved, right? You make a choice, you place that choice and that experience and that creation on your powerful flowing river of intention and you all open yourself to the power of intention and you are resolved to maintain your openness to the power of intention and you are resolved to continue moving in the direction of those things that you have chosen, I have chosen, we have chosen. And yet we want to maintain our disattachment. We want to make sure that we don't become attached to either the process of it coming about or to the result that we are anticipating. Why? Well, if we're attached to a process, knowing that we are not infallible, omniscient beings, our plans might actually not be carrying us in the direction of the experience we want to have the lover we want to include in our lives, the home we want to create, the creative project we're working on, the job we want to have, the project we're working at on, working on at our job, all of those things. We place all of those things on our vibrationally, on our powerful current of intention. And we often, because we're human, map out a plan of how I'm going to move in that direction, consciously or unconsciously. If we're attached to that plan and we're not open to the possibilities that would direct us around obstacles and in another direction that would actually include the swiftest, easiest, most joyful path to the experience we want to have, our stubbornness can become a restrictive characteristic, an indication that we are cutting ourselves off from the power of intention. If we're attached to a result, for example, I, I intend to work at this company, at this job, with this amount of money, and I'm attached to that precise, infallible, unchangeable result. There are several, if not infinite, other possibilities that could match my desires that I am excluding from my potential experience. I'm being attached to a specific result without any flexibility is another sign of resistance and a sign that we're cutting ourselves off from the powerful flow of intention. So, this week's spread, I believe, is cautioning us against stubbornness and fixedness, which is not the same as cautioning us against persistence, consistency, uh, resolve, being committed to a decision, flexibly committed. That makes sense, yes? Hopefully it does. Because friends, we're about to look at the spread. And when we look at the spread and we look at the astrology associated with the cards that have appeared in this week's spread, I think this will all become much clearer. So friends, what are we going to do? First, I'm going to show you the spread. We'll discuss the spread briefly, just in case you are new here. And then we will break the spread apart into its two major bits and we will read those, read those bits together. Are you all ready? Are you excited? Are you committed, resolved, and going to persistently watch this video to the end? I hope so, because I think it is going to be of benefit for both you and I, you and me. Okay, here we go. So friends, you just saw the spread, right? And if you've been following along this channel, you know the two decks that were part of that spread. The top three cards are from a tarot deck called the Gil Tarot. Very Thoth friendly deck. Yeah? And last week it was a little difficult to see why this deck might be a little less Thoth based than some other decks. 
while still being within the sphere of Thoth, I believe. This week we'll see one card that gives us a little bit of that indication. But still, it's a wonderful deck, and it has a guidebook. You can get the guidebook online in, in Amazon format, which I would, I would suggest. So I will have a link to the deck which you can purchase through Amazon. The deck's the real deck. Um, the guidebook um, you can find on Amazon. It's helpful. I refer to it, but really it's not my favorite introduction to the Thoth System guidebook, if that makes sense. It's, it's helpful. There are some nuances to the readings of each of the cards that I don't agree with, but having it as a companion guide, I think it's wonderful. And so there's the three card. There are the three cards from the Guild Hero above, and then the two cards from the Oracle deck, the Oracle of the Radiant Sun, an astrologically based Oracle deck. Beautiful when you want to add more astrology into your tarot readings. There will be a link in the description box below to that deck as well. Wonderful decks. All beautiful, easy to work with, easy to shuffle. Um, phenomenal decks. Now, just in case you are new here, the three cards that were at the top of the spread are tarot cards and they are in what we call a positional spread, which means that each one of the cards is responding to a prompt or a question. The prompt for the first card on the left was significance. What is the significant answer to the question I ask every week? How can we live our lives more intentionally in the coming week? So that is the significant answer. The next card is challenge, and that can be a positive challenge, something we want to reach for or, or to strive for, something to attain, or a more negative challenge, an obstacle, something we want to get around or something we want to avoid. The third card is advice. So those three cards, significance, challenge, advice. Below, we had two oracle cards, and those oracle cards give us one of three things. It can be another layer of advice, it can be a reiteration of the spread above, or it can be another layer to the spread above. We'll see how it goes this week. So friends, what are we going to do now? First, I will show you the top three cards once more, up close and personal. We'll take a dive into those, and then we'll look at the oracle cards later. Okay? Here are the three tarot cards right now. The three cards we had from left to right were the Five of Swords, the Seven of Wands, and then the, da -da -da -da, the Death card. Don't worry, the Death card is actually a very good thing, especially in this spread, I believe. So. We're not headed for doom. We're headed for some very good advice, I believe. But we're going to start off with a pretty negative card, the Five of Swords. Now, let me show you the Five of Swords in the Guild Tarot. It's a very interesting, powerful image, right? It might be a little difficult to see the Five Swords. You see the one pointing down, right? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, pointing up here in the center. There are four swords down in the red bottom of the card. They're gray on red, which might be a little difficult for you to see, but they're there. So we have the five of swords. And the swords below, um, the, sword, the four swords below are all pointed out towards us, towards the reader. And then the one again, in the center is pointing up. And one of the things that I am a little disappointed with in this deck, although there could be a case that for, uh, there could be a case made for needing to memorize the astrological associations for the cards. I get it. However, the guidebook for the guilt road does not include the astrology in the section for each card's meaning. So, I don't know, is uh, the creator of the guilt row just deciding to ignore the astrology? If so, I think that's um, sad because one of the wonderful things about the Thoth Tarot system is that the 
astrology is on the cards with Lady Frida Harris's work. And I, that's, that's wonderful. It's fabulous. It's very helpful. And still we have titles on the cards which are also helpful, right? So the Five of Swords um, originally is called Defeat. And this is the card that in the, of these three cards is the one that's a little bit outside or a little bit um, adjacent rather than in line with the Thoth system. Because this card here is called Loss, whereas the original title of the card for the Harris Crowley deck is Defeat. The astrological association is Venus in Aquarius, which is interesting because that gives us the cardinal aspect of fixed heirs vital attributes entering the reading. Yeah, the cardinal aspect of fixed heirs vital attributes. And I'm emphasizing fixed for a reason. We're going to see fixed aspects of appearing in every card in this week's spread, which is where I get the idea of stubbornness. The fixed signs are all well known for being stubborn. Torans are stubborn in their way. Leos are stubborn. No, as a Leo, I take responsibility for this. Yeah, I own this. Leos are stubborn in their way. And Aquarians are also stubborn in their own way. Now, they're going the way they know is right. Damn it. If anybody disagrees, they're the problem. Yeah, they know the best way. They know the truth. They know the correct direction. They know the just action. They know better than anybody else, right? Leos feel the correct thing. What I say is law, yeah? Torrens are, I'm going to move at my pace and you're not going to mess with me. I missed one, didn't I? Um, so I fixed water, Scorpios, definitely stubborn. Scorpio ascending, hmm? Got a lot of stubbornness in my chart. Scorpio ascending. Scorpios are also stubborn about their laser-focused attention and they know how they feel and they feel is what they feel is correct. Their judgments are correct, right? So that stubbornness can be problematic. Sometimes it can make, it can get us through problems, but still, when we want to be open to the power of intention and we want to live intentional lives, that stubbornness and that fixedness can be problematic. And this card is problematic for a number of reasons. Oh, we also have, interestingly, the exaltation here of Saturn in Libra, which is interesting, right? Because right now we have Venus in Aquarius, which is the domicile of Saturn. Saturn is exalted in Libra, which is the domicile of Venus. So we got that Venus-Saturn thing going on, yeah, in both ways. Um, people who have Venus in Aquarius are forward-thinking. They generally have tolerant attitudes, and yet they have the desire to stand out to, and to be unpredictable. Okay? So Venus can soften the fixedness of Aquarius a little bit. That's why we have the cardinal aspect of fixed air. So in this card, what do we find? We find our ideals have been or will be disrupted. Now, the idealistic um, Aquarian is getting knocked off of his, her, or their course. Yeah? Our ideals are disrupted. And we feel loss, a loss of control of a situation even. We may be, become a little bit passive. We might experience weakness because of that. When we're on course and we know we're on the right course and we know that all is well and our, we're feeling idealistic, we are energized by our own idealism. But when we get knocked off, we can, start, we can feel weak very easily, right? and we can become passive.
we don't know the right the way to go. And so Crowley suggests that this might be a good time to look for an escape strategy. Get out of the situation. We'll get some ideas, some uh, a reiteration of that idea in other cards. Yeah, look for a way out. And there might be a disparity here between how the world actually is and how we see or explain it to ourselves. Which could be a reason for that, um, for being knocked off of our high horse of idealism, our high idealistic horse, right? Because we're seeing or we're explaining the world not as it is, but as we know it should be or want it to be. So everything, is, but still, everything is out in the open now for both good or for ill. So if we start feeling a little weak, if we start feeling a little powerless, we might want to find our way out of whatever situation it is that is giving us those feelings of powerlessness or lack of energy, lack of drive. This isn't the, the time to try and get back up, up on the horse. It's the time to lead our horse away to the greener pastures, perhaps. Does that make sense? So this defeat card is a card of accepting things as they are, seeing things as they are, and finding a new path. And so we might encounter some of those situations in this coming week, right? So what is the challenge? The challenge looks very nice right off the bat. It's the Seven of Wands. The title is Valor. That sounds good, right? We have Mars in Leo, which is would be the second decanate of... No, the third decanate of Leo. Right? So we have the cardinal aspect of fixed fighters, vital attributes, entering our reading. And I believe and I forgot to write this down, I believe the sun's exalted in Aries, right? So that means we've got Leo, the sun in Aries, which is the domicile of Mars, and Mars in Leo, which is the domicile of the sun. So we've got another one of those paired things going on here. And we have, again, the cardinal aspect of fixed fire. Fixed fire, again, a little bit stubborn, potential. And yet it's called Valor. But when you look at the way Crowley describes this card, it can sometimes be being so taken with the energy of battle that we do not see the damage that we are causing. We do not see the damage of an unwinnable fight. Right, so where Aquarius has been knocked off its idealistic course, here, Leo is fighting for something that is unattainable. Yeah? Individual bravery here is called for, but it's not the, pri the bravery of fighting just for the sake of fighting. It's the bravery to be able to look at who we are, what we are doing, and, when it's t and see when it's time to stop, right? Because it may be too late to rally our forces. Every person for themselves at this time. We want to take care of ourselves. We want to put the mask over our own faces before we help somebody else. And if a battle is lost at this time, if we're battling and we're in a losing battle, the reason we're in a losing battle is because of past imbalances, which have probably led to us getting into the battle in the first place. So the suggestion by Crowley here is to get what you can and then retreat. Find a different path. Making a stand will drain our energy right now. And so the challenge is to stop fighting. If we find ourselves engaged in battle, stop fighting. Get what we can and move away. Step away from the gun or whatever it is, right? Step away from the battle. Find a new path. That's the challenge. So there is a positive challenge to be 
gained from this valor, but it's not the valor that we often consider. It's not the valor of fighting to the bitter end. This is the valor of seeing who we are, where we are, and moving past and around or away from battle. Knowing when to put the weapons down and leave. So, we come now to death. Which after that, by that discussion of battle and um, not fighting to the bitter end might seem rather ominous. Here, now this card is very, very different. Okay, so I forgot to mention the Seven of Wands. Different from Lady Crowley's uh, work, but we see seven wands coming in towards that seven here. And that female figure there standing up and holding on to that, that flaming seven, right? She is a flame. The seven is a flame. There's a lot of passion here, but it's not safe passion, right? It's burning her up. It's burning us up. And the death card, this death card looks a little bit more like a Smith Waite ish. Uh, um, it's like Smith Waite and Terre de Marseille had a child and put on some clothes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the death card of the, um, the angel of death. Also reminds me a little bit of the uh, ghost of Christmas future from uh, the Christmas Carol. The card drawn by Lady Frida Harris is much more powerful. Now we've got a dancing skeleton with a scythe on, with, looking like it's underwater. Yeah? Uh, it's also got... Um, what? It's got some other symbols for Scorpio in her artwork. We've got a snake, we've got uh, an eagle, and we've got a scorpion. Three aspects of and three symbols for Scorpio. I guess, okay, so it's hard to see, but there's a bird down here. Could that be an eagle? If it is, it looks really, really small. Um, there is what could be a scorpion there, maybe. I don't really see a snake. But it's an interesting card, certainly. And death is associated with Scorpio, which is the domicile of Mars, from which we have, yes, fixed water. So we had fixed air, fixed fire, now we have fixed water. And in a little bit, we're gonna get some fixed earth, so hold on to your horses. So death, fixed water. And death connects Tipreth and Netzach. Yeah, it connects the heart with valor and victory, well, victory, I should say, not valor. Valor was the seven of wands. It connects, connects Tipreth, the heart of the tree of life, beauty, with Netzach of victory. And it's associated with the Hebrew letter Nun, um, which is a serpent or a fish. Yeah, serpent, a good uh, symbol for Scorpio. It's also carrying knowledge from the old world over into the new. Think Noah's Ark. Now, where the old world was destroyed and the creatures and Noah and his family carry the knowledge from the old world into the new. Now, it's also the waters of destruction here in Nun. Now, because we have Nun, we also have the rune Perthro, which kind of looks like a... A, a dice cup that's been turned on its side, right? And it's um, the room for decision, but also mystery and prophecy. Prophecy, a, a good scorpion quality. Also mystery is a scorpion quality. Scorpio quality, I should say, not scorpion. Well, scorp maybe scorpion too. Um, there's some uncertainty with Perthro, but there are also occult skills and initiation. Yeah, there's also the idea of fertility. Now the death card can be a fertile card because the death card gives us the mulch for the new thing to grow. 
and salt. Crowley suggests this is the time to face facts. Perfect, considering we had this Five of Swords telling us, look, we might not be seeing things as they actually are. We have the Seven of Wands telling us, look, we might not be seeing the battle as it actually is. So here it's time to face facts. We want to dance with the coming change and embrace it. That's the advice. Look at things for what they are. Embrace the change. Finding the new path. Don't be so stubborn. And any strain that we feel is a sign of attachment. That stubbornness that comes with those fixed signs. If we feel like we're straining to win the battle, to get back up on our idealistic horse, we're... We're, we're being, we're, that is a sign of our attachment. That's what I'm trying to say. So cut through our fixed ideas and comforts to release something new with that scythe, like the scythe being held by the robed figure of death. Cut through the fixed ideas. Cut through the fixed passions. The determination to win the battle. Cut through that and let the new emerge, because it will emerge. Once we've cut through the bondage that we're creating for ourselves of those fixed, stubborn ideas and fixed, stubborn passions, decisions, actions. That makes sense, right? And so, even though the death card is associated with Scorpio, which is another fixed sign, it's the sign of Cut the bullshit, and right now, that cutting of the bullshit is going to allow that which has been fertilized beneath to emerge and blossom. That's pretty cool, huh? Considering we started off with something rather negative, rather unsettling, we're coming to a change for the better hopefully within this week, and, that, and allowing that to happen and doing that work of cutting through so that it can happen is the advice for us right now. Now, we do have two more cards from the Oracle deck. I'll show you the cards and let's see if, is it advice? Is it a reiteration or is it another layer? Let's look. You saw from the two cards in a line, we had number six, discrimination. And then to the right of that, we had number 10 for convention. Did you also notice that both of these cards were associated with Venus, right? And it's because both of these cards are associated with Venus that we have fixed aspects. Did you also notice that both of these cards are associated with signs in the Earth suit? Yeah, first one was Virgo, the second one was Capricorn, both Earth. So we have fixed aspects of mutable and cardinal Earth. So we've got a lot of fixed energy in this week's spread, a lot of fixed attributes. And the first card, number six, is discrimination, right? What do we see here? Well, we see Venus in Virgo, which are two words that are, that I get confused so often. If you know me, you've heard it before, yeah? I get Venus, the sign of Venus, not the planet Venus, but the sign of Venus when I'm thinking of Virgo, yeah? So Venus in Virgo, I have to think about that a second. But because of that, we have the fixed aspect of mutable Earth here, right? The fixed aspect of mutable Earth. Um, what does that mean? Now we have that organizational um, Virgo aspect of, mu of mutable Earth. Clean it up. Get it all organized. Get the things in its boxes and let's figure this out. We have the Tauran how uh, domicile of that, the, the Tauran decanate of 
Uh, Virgo, Virgo, not Venus, Virgo, the Tauran decanate of Virgo, which is the domicile of Venus, right? So there's that stubbornness and I'm going to do it at my own pace and you're not going to mess with me. I'm going to enjoy, I'm going to enjoy where I am. I'm going to enjoy stuff, but you're not going to mess with me as I do this stuff. And I'm going to enjoy organizing things, putting things in the correct place because I, because my knowledge is correct. What do we see here on the card? We have a barefoot woman in a neat countryside reaching for butterflies. Yeah, reaching for spirit, reaching for beauty, reaching for transcendence. And we also see a barking fox. Do you see the barking fox down there? Is the fox barking at the butterflies? Maybe. But that, butter, that barking fox is a sign that Virgo cares for and rules small, delicate creatures. Because the, the female, barefoot female figure is Virgo, caring for, showing, com, showing affection for the butterflies and the little barking fox. Does that make sense? So, um, this is card number six because it is Virgo the sixth sign of the uh, zodiacal calendar. The attributes associated with this car point us in the direction of the danger of overanalyzing emotions. We feel things and we, because of Venus, we feel things and Virgo wants to pick it apart. But emotional analysis in this card, well-directed can be helpful and it can help others. We could be counselors for others, but over-analysis is going to be problematic. Being so fixed on breaking it down into its minutia is going to be counterproductive. So we analyze well, not superficially, but we analyze our emotions, the emotions of others well, without getting over and analytical right? Without trying to go too far, too deep, too, getting too picky. We also might want to be selective with who we give our, with to whom we give our affection. And yet we still want to be careful of being too picky. We want to let people in. We want to be affectionate. Not to everybody. We want to be selective, but not too selective. This is a card of balancing emotions and how we, how we share those emotions. Our relationships centered on work and health are good. Your friends at the gym, for example, yeah? your friends at work are going to be very beneficial for you, for me. Yeah? Friends uh, who cook together, li live healthfully together, perhaps. We want to have a harmonious and beautiful work environments as well. Now, yeah? take care of the space that we're working in, whether we're working at home or in an office or somewhere else, we want to have a beautiful working environment. And we want to be selective and use proper discretion to attain what we want to attain. Looking at things clearly, being analytical, but not over analytical, because over analysis brings on paralysis, right? We don't want that. But remember, in the three cards above, we were advised to take clear stock of what it is that we are doing, what we, the direction we're going, the activities we're involved in, our, and, and our headspace. We want to be um, certain that we are not attached to old ideals that are no longer or perhaps never were valid, right? Because we might not be seeing things as they are in truth. We might not be explaining things as they are 
in truth. So this card is here to remind us to be clear, be give new analysis. And the death card told us, again, to cut through the bullshit. So this is part of that, without going too far, right? Now this next card is also very interesting, yeah? This is the convention card, it's number 10. It's Venus in Capricorn. So we have the fixed aspect of Cardinal Earth, Capricorn being Cardinal Earth, right? So Venus being the Tauran decanate of Capricorn. And on the card here, we have a neat, well cared for house above an orderly garden. And in that garden, we have a child's face surrounded by a stone wall, which gives us the ideas of family restrictions. So we, there might be some potential of restrictive relationships here. And we want relationships with people who can help us achieve, definitely. But there are some other relationships might become confining. And if so, that could be a problem. People who have Venus in Capricorn can often appear very conservative because they have very conservative behaviors and yet they can have very zany senses of humor. And their relationships can be lively and entertaining. And that's what we want. So if, as long as our relationships are lively and entertaining, if, even if we're doing things just the way we've done them or everybody else has done them, we're behaving in a conservative way. If we maintain our sense of humor, a little bit zany, if, if it's zany, the better, we're good. Yeah, all is golden. And an interesting thing about this card is, there could be a beneficial relationship between somebody who is significantly older and or and someone who is significantly younger. So whatever that puts you, yeah, if you're you could be the significantly older one, or you could be the significantly younger one. I'm 60. I could still be the significantly younger one. I could run into somebody who is 80 and that 80 or 90 and that relationship could be beneficial to me. Right? You're 20. You could still be the significantly older one. The significantly younger one could be a teenager or a child. And maybe that relationship will be a benefit for you to attain in ways that we can't imagine at this moment. And having strong social and artistic ambitions are wonderful. And we want to be known as talented and successful. That's fine. That's wonderful. So, mixing love and money here is actually going to be okay. Now, does that mean sex, go out and do sex work? Not necessarily. That's not what I'm saying. Nothing against sex workers, nothing at all. And yet, I don't think that's what we're talking about here. I'm not telling everybody to go out and sell your wares on the streets, right? That's not what I'm saying. But mixing love and money is okay. Here. So what did we have for these two cards, yeah? We, we want to analyze, but not overanalyze our relationships. We want to be... We want to include people, but not everybody. We want to be selective, but not too picky about the people that we inter we're inter interacting with. Ah, yep. Yeah. And those people that we are interacting with, we can have fun with. Yeah. We can have lively and entertaining relationships with these people. And some of those, these people might be significantly older or significantly younger. Our affection can be part business, and that's okay. That could be beneficial. Yeah? And we allow ourselves to, sh to be seen for the talented and successful people that we are. We don't have to worry about being avant-garde or innovative now. We can be our wacky, our own wacky selves in enjoyable relationship with other people as we do the stuff that we've been doing 
consistently. And yet we don't want to, again, when we, again from above, when we find ourselves engaged in battle, that's not a good sign, stop. We find ourselves, our mental energy has collapsed because things aren't as we thought they were, or, or they're not matching the story we're telling ourselves, stop, find a new way, cut through the bullshit, allow the new to grow. So I think these two cards were giving us an extra layer of advice. Do you agree? If you do, let me know in the comments below. If you do not, let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. And friends, I'd also like to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for hitting the thumbs up button. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. You help other people find us here. And if they find us and they enjoy the content here and they enjoy participating, it's better for all of us. Don't you? Do you agree? I hope you do. And if you want a private reading from me, my email, as always, in the, is in the description box below. Shoot me an email to thehangedmaninthemoon at gmail.com. We'll get you a reading. Whatever you want. Short, long, your choice. And friends, now, as always, I wish you love joy, well-being, and pure awareness. Thank you.